You're listening to the world's smartest podcast network. When I go to Sacramento, I will pump up Sacramento. Sacramento. Some say the news is fake. Others say it's real. These two don't have the time to check. Instead, Turner Sparks and Michael Ira Kaplan turn to comics stationed around the globe to be their eyewitness reporters so that you can know what's really going on. This is Lost in America. All right, everybody, welcome to Lost in America, episode 227. My name's Turner Sparks. And I am Michael O. Kaplan. You can find me Top at of the morning to you. turnersparks.com. <laughs> Buy my album, Turner Sparks, live from the Friars Club. You can find Kaplan, <clears throat> uh, Michael O. Kaplan, excuse me, at Cap in America on all social media channels. Kaplan, we have Des Bishop on the podcast today. We're talking about Ireland. We're going to get bring him in in just a second. But we had Des Bishop on the podcast yesterday. I was going to say, we, we're doing we're doing back-to-back episodes again. A little deja vu here. The audience doesn't know this, but the three of us got together yesterday, did an entire hour and 20 Great episode. Podcast. Really good one. Everyone should listen. It was our best episode ever. <laughs> it was really good. I very four minutes long. And uh, at the very funny. end of the episode, I went, wow, I just, I think Dez say, even said something. He's like, you guys are real pros. Because I was like, we're going to we'll get it out tonight. And he's like, wow. You guys. I made a comment. I said, this guy, Turner, he gets it out fast. You should see. He gets it he, out fast. And then I realized yeah. I never pressed record. Mm, to begin yeah. the episode. So well, when you we, called me right after the episode and I thought you were calling when we have a good one, we always talk afterwards. We feel yeah, good. We, when we have a bad one. I don't hear from you. You don't hear from me. You thought I was dumping one, Gatorade on your Yeah. Head. You were calling to celebrate. We got, we put one in the bat. That's a great one. We could coast for a month now. Yeah. And you said, yeah. Bad news. I didn't press record. I just, here's the good news. Kaplan. <laughs> I live my life like I'm I do these episodes like I'm studying for a high school final. And mm -hmm. then the next day I just forget everything. Yes. So uh, it's, that's a great. And that's exactly what I feel like with my brain. Cause I always think I made a comment yesterday when we were recording. I said, I feel like so much smarter. I'm going to tell my kids like all the stuff I learned before I forget. Yeah. Because before you forget is today. That's a day later. I've already forgotten everything. God forbid Gone. we could ever just listen to our own podcast to remind no. ourselves what we learned. <laughs> no, we so, don't do that. We just put it out and we go, all right, we're, we're geniuses now. And then two weeks later, somebody's like, hey, that Ireland thing, what happened with this? And it's like, I have no idea. So uh, Des is back. He graciously agreed to come back to the show. But before we get to him, Kaplan, people are digging this show. Last week, we had Ari Shafir on. Uh, that boosted our numbers. We got a ton of new people who came in from our fear. What, but th it's fine that you're joining the show. It's fine. You're listening, but it don't do much for us unless you're yeah. subscribed to our it's Patreon. It's not even fine. We don't even want you. We got to pay rent. We got to pay. We got, I mean, you say we got to pay rent. I have to figure this all out. I got, uh, it's April, right? People are getting, the, I got the vaccine. You got the vaccine. Everyone's getting the vaccine. Everyone's going back to work. You know, yeah. you know what that means? What? My wife wants to know when I'm going back to work. When are you yeah, going you to get a She's job? He says, when are you going to get a job? What's your plan? I said, my plan, I'm getting this unemployment. I'm doing the pod. It's great. <laughs> unemployment had, is the plan. We had a sponsor for like a month or two months. It was we great. Like, we, we were living it up, but apparently I need more. I need to bring in more income. I got two kids. So what do I need? I need so, Patreon money. Yeah. 51 <laughs> Patreon subscribers giving us $300 a month doesn't cut the mustard. Sir, they're not going to make it to community college at that rate, Mike children. <laughs> <laughs> So patreon.com slash lost in America. Kaplan and I give you three extra episodes, half hour episodes. Listen to them on the way to work. It's, it's drive time radio we're doing. It's you and me, life in New York City. You're running for city council. We're uh, outing your competitors because we can't get a lot. You, we've, we've come to the realization that you're not very popular nah, as a candidate. I'm not, I'm not well so liked. Goal <laughs> is to make everyone else less popular. That's my campaign. What's that strategy called? We, we have to ask a political science. Muck raking. Muck raking. Yes, because and then, and we're going great because we had an episode last week that uh, uh, some people asked me if they could send it to other people who weren't listening in the neighborhood. I said, sure. And right after that went around, uh, I get a little file ends up in my with my doorman. He, he says, I got something for you. He just gives me a little manila envelope. Mr. Kaplan, I got something for you. Wait I got something for you. I said, who'd this come from? He goes, they didn't say. They showed up in a trench coat with a with a with a with a fake mustache it's on a the end of the throat situation. <laughs> Is this and, politically related, Kaplan? Yeah. And it was it was a file of dirt on my competitors. Oh, good. So I'm gonna release it slowly each week. I'm gonna I'm gonna get him into I'm gonna we're getting to the mud. 
and I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up all their dirty secrets. I got some. Re- this is re- I'm not doing a bit. I have real dirt to bring up. <laughs> yeah, someone genuinely did give you dirt on a. What do they call it? What do they call it when uh, the Trump Russia thing? What was it? a dossier? A dossier. You have a, <laughs> you have a now, dossier. None of my competitors have impeded on that I know of, but <laughs> that could. Be, I'm not saying it won't get that in the next file. So, on yeah. the podcast today, uh, Des is on. He Des is an American comedian who, when he was 14, moved to Ireland, um, and. Came back 31 years later. So essentially, he's Irish-American, but just as much Irish as he is American in terms of where he's lived. And we saw in the news, there's Northern Ireland's going nuts, Nor- which just feels very old school. Um, yeah, Northern s- Ireland, there's riots going on once again in Northern Ireland. It might be Brexit related. I'm not exactly sure. We saw there was a lot in Northern Ireland. There was a lot of uh, violence. There was a bus that was lit on fire. I saw a double-decker bus, which is... Yeah. I mean, uh, that's the only kind they have over there, but they lit a bus on fire. There was the police were getting stuff thrown at them and injured. And, and we thought the violence was done there. They, they had an agreement. They made peace years ago. Yeah. Right? I thought it was done. We haven't heard much Northern Ireland violence recently. So it was shocking to read in the news. I looked it up. It turns out you got two sides. This is what I'm going to say what I know. Okay. Yeah. Two sides. <laughs> you have the loyalists who are loyal. There's two and they're both, can, they both have violent subsects of these sides. There's the IRA, which we all know about. We right? all know and love. And IRA. those are called, and the, the people who align with them are called nationalists, as far as I understand. And they want to be a part of Ireland. Okay. Right. And I, everyone should get a map out right now, actually. And just look at what I, the island of Ireland looks like. Because there's a, there's a line, there's a border two thirds of the way up. Yeah, and that's, um, that's what we, I want to get into why that borders. Are. But so that's that's the that's the nationalists. And then on the other side, you have the loyalists who are loyal to the crown. We had those people in America one time. I think we kicked them out to Canada or something, <laughs> but they're loyal to the crown they're, and they're equal. They're also violent. <clears throat> and I think the loyalists are the ones here that are lighting stuff off, which is a shock to me because I've never even heard of the loyalists. I've only I didn't know the there was violence. Yeah. I always thought there was just violence in the IRA side and maybe the loyalists, they saw that Meghan Markle interview with the uh, Oprah and they saw bad stuff about the crown. They said, we got to deflect. Yeah. So it was probably they, based off Meghan Markle. They said, let's cause some violence in the streets. Cause that's what we were reading is that the, 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 this new violence I think is on that side. It's paramilitary loyalist, I believe, but Is maybe that it's word again. Sides. Paramilitary. Is hey, that word? Paramilitary. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, why is the violence happening? What why is it happening again? What's the history of all this? Why is Northern Ireland? Why is Ireland split into Des Bishop? A basic, very basic. We don't understand. We got to start at the basics. Des Bishop, welcome to the show. And also, I want to give you a proper introduction. Des is a fantastic stand up comedian. Tours Europe, tours the United States of America. And I met him in China uh, maybe seven, eight, nine years ago. He was filming a TV show for Irish TV where he was learning Chinese language in a year. I believe he started from zero. And at the end of the year, did stand up in Chinese, which and I could only do after maybe 10 years. And I bombed horribly. And mm. Des does, does very he did well. It seamlessly, I heard. Hey, it's Des, welcome and to the then, show. And then he was one of our first guests ever. So welcome back. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's great. It's great to be back. Uh, can I just, it's, it's hard to believe Turner, but actually it was eight years ago. Like, you was know, you eight? were like seven, eight, nine. Yeah. It was 2013. Uh, that, that I went I over there. It just goes so fast. It's insane. I don't know. Uh, I was there from two, I was in China from 2004 to 2016. And you, in my head, you were there the same year as another friend of mine. And he left in like 2006. So just, yeah, it all just, it all becomes one. <laughs> yeah. The expat experience becomes one giant, one thing mixed together. And I, I don't know if we met playing the way I heard about you is I play on a Gaelic football team and the guys on my team were like, Hey, this comedian just showed up at our game. This famous comedian, Des Bishop, showed, the, all the Irish guys were like, Hey, he showed up at our game. You should meet him. And then we met later at a club or something. I'm not sure. No, no, actually what happened was we were coming down to film with the GA guys and mm. well before the game, you, they had obviously told you, by the way, this guy is coming down to film. Uh, would you would you put him on at the club? Because that first yes. trip, I did do a spot at the club. And actually, I think I interviewed that very first weekend. I interviewed you and I interviewed Andy because uh, we wanted to talk about the, the expat comedy experience in but China. Can I fill in a detail that you might not know? I know for a fact it was not weeks before because I think 20, we put, we found out that you were in town 24 hours before the show. It was St. Patrick's Day weekend. 
Ooh. And do you remember this? We put the tickets on sale in, and they sold out in 24 hours. And down the street, there was like three Irish comedians who were on tour who they've been marketing for months and we sold more tickets than they did. So that's that, I, I do. I do remember that now that there was an yeah. impromptu. It was an impromptu thing. That's right. That's but it right. sold out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because the University College Cork had their their program was in the University of Shanghai or whatever university is in Shanghai. Uh, so all those Cork students came down. So that was, that was great. It was amazing. It was a blast. And then for instance, so how do we do on the Irish history? Well, first of all, <laughs> did we get it right with the loyalists and the national loyalists? Now national. we did say before we started that we're not going to keep referring back to the fact that we did this already yesterday, but I yes. just want to point out. You can do it once. You did a lot better today than you did yesterday. <laughs> yes. And, we're 20 percent uh, smarter. That's our goal. <laughs> <laughs> you pretty you got it right today. I can't even I can't even correct you. So now we can now we can just get into it because I have absolutely no problem repeating all this because it's been good for me. I actually know more than I knew yesterday, too, because I I went I back that. and checked on a, a few of my vague. You know, I, sometimes you make vague statements because you kind of know that they're sort of based in fact, but you don't really know. And I, 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 I double checked a couple of things. I definitely condensed a lot of what happened in the 1600s down to sort of like two events it was a little more but, complicated you know, than that but for our for our purposes actually not important it just saves me because it didn't go out it saves me from the fact checkers coming at me being like you we, booze, we don't have, but we don't have fact checkers we like to say our audience accepts it on facts so our ideal guest knows yeah. some but also blowhards a lot and because the last thing we, we, we had we've had guests on before we go so what's this like and they go oh i don't know anything about that and we're like, well, there's the end of the podcast. That's a we'll bad see guess. you guys next week. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we don't mind if you fudge the facts a little bit, play fast and loose with the facts. Well, it's honestly, fun. but the, the, the thing is that I'm such a history nerd that I, I, I'm actually, I've been delighted with the opportunity to go back and double check that because there's just certain things that you sort of, I've double checked numerous times in my life, like when Cromwell kicked in and stuff like that. Like we didn't talk about Cromwell yesterday. We won't talk about him today. We're not going to make this longer than yesterday because it was insanely <laughs> long, but it was just nice to recheck because actually like I did once again forget at certain important aspects of the sort of Stuart English Civil War, Cromwell, Charles the First. You know, there's just like a lot of shit from English history that I'm just not solid on that I now know because of you guys. I'm not going to get into it today, that. but what I'm just saying things? because of the fuck up, I'm, I'm smarter today than I was yesterday. Fantastic. Let's start here. Why mm -hmm. is Ireland split into two things? The, the island, what, two what to countries. us looks like an island that should be one country. Why is it split? And part of North, Northern Ireland, for those who don't know, is part of the United Kingdom. We'll, we'll, we'll even back up a little bit. So why is that? Why did that happen? For your real time. Yeah, so that. essentially it's three quarters, one quarter, really, when you look at it. It's 26 counties of the Republic of Ireland and then the six counties of Northern Ireland, which comprises six counties of the province of Ulster, Ulster actually has nine counties, but the six counties of Ulster became uh, part uh, became Northern Ireland after the Boundary Commission in 1922. So the very quick synopsis of how this happened goes right back to the 1600s. OK, in fact, it really goes back to King Henry VIII, uh, which I'm, I'm sure you weren't expecting. But uh, King Henry the King Henry VIII, the Tudors really began the conquest of Ireland. You know, like the English started getting involved in Ireland from about the 1200s, which is why Irish people always talk about 800 years of oppression. However, uh, the, the real stuff that affects the way we look at Ireland today came from the Tudor conquest of Ireland, which eventually succeeded by the early 1600s. However, in Ulster, in the north, the biggest resistance came from... The, the Gaelic chieftains of that province uh, who were the O'Neills and all their, you know, all the people that are aligned. I mean, honestly, if you actually read the history, it reads really like Game of Thrones, like it really wow. does, because there's a lot of alliances and there's a lot of um, people that sell out for, for land. And, you know, it's no surprise that series like the G Game of Thrones sort of sort of lean on this old school history of patronage and land and allegiances. So, so the Tudors were who? They were British? The Tudors, sorry, they, uh, I, I, they were the monarchs. They were the rulers of England. So King Henry VIII. I see. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth I. And then actually, which is one of the important things that I corrected uh, today, James I, who's actually the king in charge during the plantation of Ulster, which I'm about to tell you about. He was actually the first of the Stuarts, the child of... 
Mary, Queen of Scots. And if you ever watch the series, The Tudors, you will see all that stuff playing out. But it's not that important for this. What's important for this is the O'Neills were defeated. Won't get into all the allegiances mm-hmm. and negotiations and treaties of Melifons and all these things that, that were involved. What matters, though, is as a result of the fact that uh, uh, the Ulster Irish, that basically the Catholic Gaelic people of Ulster were considered to be the biggest threat to Ireland not remaining under the crown. So uh, a plan to, uh, to calm that area was that they would invite uh, Scottish Presbyterians from the Scottish lowlands and also uh, Church of England people from Northern England. They would give them land in uh, that part of Ireland, uh, essentially a forced colonization of that part of Ireland. Uh, and the requirement was that they had to be Protestant and loyal to the crown. So suddenly that part of Ireland had a much higher percentage of Protestant people loyal to the crown in Ireland. And from the very beginning of their time in that part of Ireland, they were considered to be in power of the ascendancy. And they were uh, the ruling that, class. They were the ruling class. In fact, the another, 1600s. Thing, another thing that I checked in the interim was there was n- numerous uprisings in that first few decades of that change, uh, which also helped to instill uh, a paranoia within the Protestant community that they were always under attack. So uprisings the, against the crown, you mean? Or, uh, the, the uprisings against the crown, and also yeah. uprisings against the, the the Protestants that came in and and okay. took the land. That are living so there in was, Northern Ireland, yeah. yeah, yeah. There was a sense, and, and Cap, since you like to make these uh, you know comparisons between Israel, I, I guess in a way I like to make them. <laughs> <laughs> the, I'm I not guess, the one making them. <laughs> uh, I guess in a way, uh, if 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 you think of it in terms of. Um, people having conflicting claims on land, uh, it, you're just always in that battle of who has a right to it and who, how far are people willing to go to protect it. That yes. all began way back. People like to look at the, the 1900s as what are the problems in Northern Ireland. All that tension and all that land ownership and who's in charge began back in the 1600s. And then we just skip over the entire English and Irish conflict how did Wait, i have a question i got a question here so was the idea of the crown of the tudors of king henry the eighth to take all of ireland but they only got a quarter of the way down no no, no actually no. it's the opposite that the last oh. place was ulster they, Wait, they, they had the whole they had, they had the oh. rest of the country already uh now when i you know it's it's really too complicated to get into it and yeah. i am not an expert on it because there's a lot of Like, you know, like, like, again, we'll just use Game of Thrones as an example. There's a lot of, you know, uh, people that were once fighting with the crown that then decide to be loyal to the crown, but they still have power. They still have land. You know, you you see a lot of the castles in Ireland. All this stuff is connected to all this. It's, It's very much of the feudal system. It's feudal history. It's too complicated to get into. We've moved on from feudalism in the meantime. Now we have corporate feudalism. Can I just drop a political point? But anyway, my point is... All that stuff is too complicated because it's not necessary to know for now. Okay. The thing that's necessary to know is why is that section of Ireland different to the rest of Ireland? Because the and other part, because, I was just saying, the other part of Ireland is Catholic, but it's just they weren't as. But Cap, yeah, you were just about I, to tell us sorry, why. Sorry, okay, no, 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 no. But I was going to say, like, all of Ireland was Catholic. The right. reason why there's less of a percentage of Catholics in that area is because of the plantation of Ulster. Yeah. There was other plantations in Ireland, but they weren't successful. They didn't hold like the plantation of Ireland was, which was essentially a successful movement of people from Scotland and Northern England to that part of Ireland. They, 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 they got a foothold, and then centuries later, they were the dominant population in that part of Ireland. So like obviously Native Americans look at us and be like, who the fuck are you to think that you own this land? But hundreds of years later, we're not thinking that we have to leave, right? So hundreds of years later, this was actually around the same time, coincidentally enough, hundreds of years later, these people weren't thinking, oh, you you know, it was yours originally, we're going to go. They're thinking, this is our land, we're in charge, this is our culture, we're loyalists, we're unionists, and this is ours. And the conflict of independence between Ireland and England that rose up in the 19, uh, late 1980s you know, into the early 1920s created a, a new flashpoint, which is how the border is created. Ask me another question. Ah, so the border is <laughs> not created till 1918. No, the border is not created till 19. Well, actually, the, the conditions that created the border happened in 1922. But let's, yeah. let, me, let, let you ask a question because let's frame... The, the let's frame the context of 
how the border was created because we well, kind of so, jumped into it there, and but it requires a little more of a backstory. Here's would be my question: When they created the border, they're lopping off twenty five percent of the island that we would think is Ireland. Are there only loyalists? within that region or are there also if you're just an irish person all of a sudden they create a border and they're like now you're in the uk now you're now you're i guess it was all the uk at that point but now you're in a different place yeah so my question yeah so what happened was i mean from literally from the beginning of british rule there were uprisings against the british in ireland uh various degrees of success but none of them none of them succeeded a, a long term at all uh there was various methods by the British to uh, to quell the Irish people. Lar- largely, it was penal. You know, largely it was it was punitive, and it never really created a sense of Irish people seeing well Irish Catholics mostly seeing themselves as British. So there was always a sense of unrest in Ireland. But the British rule of Ireland essentially created a peasant class, uh, a Catholic peasant class that slowly, throughout the 1800s, began to feel that there would be a better way to be ruled other than under British rule. Uh, The punitive parts of of British rule of Ireland were slowly being dismantled, but somehow a momentum kicked off in the 1900s that was, we no longer want reform, we want independence. And that independence movement was kind of kicked off by a failed rising in 1916, which probably would have just been a footnote in Irish history, except that they the British quite brutally executed all the leaders. And that execution led to a, a sort of a, a nationalist fervor that, that uh, caused a, an, a war of independence that began in 1918. And by 1922, at the end of that war of independence, uh, in the treaty negotiations between the rebels, quote unquote, the, which was the original IRA, the Irish Republican Army, and the British, one of the things in that treaty, and there were many, one of the things in that treaty was that a boundary commission needed to be created for the population of the North, which was clearly different to the rest of the country. And if I could jump back just one more time again, was violently opposed to being part of an independent Irish Republic. They had created the Ulster Volunteer Force in 1914. They ran guns through the port of Larne and the main unionist leaders, as they're called, they want to remain in a union with Great Britain. The main unionist leaders signed the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant, and some of them signed it in their own blood. And that document was basically saying, you come and you try to even put a devolved government. They, were, they weren't even <laughs> against independence. They were against a devolved government with any independence uh, from the UK. You come and fucking try and we will fight you to our last man. So there was, a, there was a, clearly a problem. They were also quite powerful people, industrialists. The north of Ireland was more successful. Their agriculture was more successful. Textile industry was very successful. Shipbuilding industry was very successful. Of course, a little historical footnote, the Titanic was built in Belfast. Huge ship, uh, shipbuilding industry. All that stuff had these people still considering themselves quite powerful. So the last thing they wanted was to be part of this country run by a bunch of fucking Catholic peasants. Home rule is Rome rule. That's what they used to say. They hated the papists, all these sort of sectarian terms. And uh, so the Boundary Commission was created. However, uh, it was quickly dealt with and they created this border that makes no fucking sense. Six counties of Northern Ireland remained part of the UK. And from 1920s until the civil rights movement in the 1960s, Catholics were second class citizens and a Protestant state was born in the North. And that uh, numerous decades period created the tension that would eventually lead to the troubles. And that's where we're at. Okay, one question. Um, Why would the crown, why would the United Kingdom want that piece of Northern Ireland? Is it strategic? Like, is there a port? Or is it uh, there's minerals there? Like whenever the United States takes over somewhere, it's because there's minerals or something or there's right. oil or something. Do you or, know what I mean? And it's not like a religious thing. Like when you bring up Israel, it's not like a battle over. Yeah, something. there's no it's no, not a holy land for anybody as far as I can tell. No, honestly, I, I, I'm not the most qualified to answer that question. But okay. I, I, but, but I think it's safe to assume that by the time Northern Ireland was created, there was nothing strategic about it. OK, uh, I mean. Some people might argue, perhaps because, you know, a lot of this happened just after World War One, that they wanted to maintain some sort of a port in the North Atlantic. But that wouldn't really make any sense. Honestly, you probably want to think of it more as how would America react if, you know, 
half of, you know, like most of America wanted to be independent and some people wanted to stay, they would probably consider it some sort of moral obligation. I mean, yes. You no. Know, and also for the record, uh, I guess, you know, th there was, you know, I, I historically, I don't know, there may have actually, you know, because all these people have met, you know, all these people are members of parliament. So the, it, it's not that they're without a say. In fact, only recently, the Democratic Unionist Party ended up with the with the sway in the vote in the UK. I don't know if you, you follow that, but post Brexit, the DUP's uh, seats in the parliament, the, their, their official MPs actually were very important. The conservative government relied on them to maintain power in the UK, you know, because their political system is a little different. So I'm sure there were numerous reasons, but I think the main reason is basically that these people wanted to stay. And at the end of the day, it was the UK. It wasn't yeah. like they were just going to be like, okay, bye. And for numerous decades after creating the border, this Protestant state, which kind of ruled as they saw fit, didn't really cause any problems for the UK. So it really wasn't an issue. So I'm sure most people in the UK were probably thinking like, oh, yeah, Belfast, cool, no problem. You know, just like not an issue. The same way I'm sure the average uh, New Yorker that wasn't that sort of akin to, to domestic affairs probably wasn't that concerned with the Jim Crow South until suddenly it became an issue. And yeah, right. I, I'm not trying to say in any way, shape or form that uh, Catholics experienced the same level of discrimination that blacks in the South did under Jim Crow, but there definitely was a, an element of second class citizens, non-access to jobs, uh, bad housing, bad education. There was 100% real discrimination. And the other thing that's important to point out is that the Northern Irish Civil Rights Movement, which is the thing that begins the Troubles, was inspired by Martin Luther King and the American Civil Rights Movement. They were inspired by that. So that, you know, that uprising of, of, of dissent and dissatisfaction in the United States did inspire Catholics to rise up in the North. And it was that Civil Rights Movement that began the Troubles, as they are known, which is the precursor to this episode. So from like the 1920s to the 1960s, it's quiet. These Catholics are living as underclass in their own, what they consider their own land. And now they are like, I've had enough of this. And my own grandfather left that. My own grandfather was from the North and he emigrated away from that, you know? Okay. And, and it was unfortunate because, you know, the Republic of Ireland was now independent. I mean, officially it became a Republic in 1949, but from 1922 on the Irish free state governed itself essentially. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, nationalists in the North were, didn't get the result. You know, so they're they fought for freedom, too, but they are not free, quote unquote. They're still living under uh, under the British system. So they, they, there's a, a huge they, they, there's just so many issues. And, 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 and those two countries would then evolve very differently. You know, for a long time, people felt like economically were probably better off in the north. OK, but obviously you're you're experiencing discrimination. So there's just it's just it's just very it's very complicated, to be honest. Yeah. But the most important thing is that the the policing the jobs and the housing were, and this is a historical fact, were discriminatory against Catholics. And, and it was, it was quite, uh, you know, I don't know what the word is, but it was, it was nefarious. I mean, it was, it was. And how bad. can you tell, how can you tell if someone's a Catholic or a Protestant? Walk, is it like clothing walking down the street? What's the, there was no yeah. way to That's tell. A few, I have some, no idea. There's no <laughs> way, there's no way to tell whether somebody's Catholic or Protestant. That's, I mean, in, in reality, uh, I think if you, you spit in a cup and send it to ancestry.com, you're not going to find a huge difference in probably you know, a what, little of both. Yeah. You know, it's, it, 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 so it's much more about symbolism and identity. You know, I mean, people talk about identity politics here. They have no fucking idea because identity politics in the North is literally life and death. Uh, that's why symbolism is so important. And actually, if you follow the politics of the North, even still to this day, there's always fights over symbols, flags, the Irish language. Um, if Jesus know, what, is on the cross or not on the cross. Is that a thing? Oh, Jesus is always on the cross. It's actually the Virgin Mary. It's the Virgin Mary is the difference. Oh. The Protestants don't believe in a Virgin Mary. But, uh, but our church, she's not. We, we don't. There's no. There's the cross. There's a crucifix in the church, but Jesus is not on it he's not hanging. oh really well yeah. yeah i i i'm no expert on protestantship because i was brought up to hate them so uh <laughs> well where I, I land because i grew up protestant but i went to catholic high school jesuit high school so that do i get a foot in both or am i just hated by everybody 
you, you get a foot in both. I mean, all right. You, know, you, you can't, you can't, beat, the, you can't beat the Jesuits. You know, yes. what's that? What's that? Ha- would there be any intermarriage, or would that be so scandalous? Oh I mean, yeah, Protestants and Catholics. Well, well, we, 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 like, uh, like we can talk about story. it in a lighthearted way, but actually, there was huge problems even in the Republic of Ireland, particularly after independence, because. There's just a whole other story of the way the Protestants were treated in the South. I mean, like nobody gets off scot free in this story. This is like, a, <laughs> you know, like right, this is yeah. a dark Irish. Nobody's history. innocent. Yeah, well, you know, like all history, it it it's it's uh, there's a lot of conflict and there's a lot of hate and it takes a long time to heal it. You know, largely in the Republic, uh, you know, all the residue of the battle for independence in the early 20s is gone. Uh, but it took a long time. Even the main two political parties in Ireland, their division is the civil war. They actually have very little between them in terms of their policies. But the allegiances are still based on the Irish civil war, which is another episode. We'll talk about that another time. Separate issue. But but what I'm saying is the division was those two people. It was it was to do with the treaty. It was treaty and anti-treaty. And that political yeah. divide still exists in Ireland, even though, it, you know, it, it's, it's literally pointless. Right. So uh, in, in the north and in the south, there was always a. Uh, a big issue with intermarriage, Protestants and Catholics marrying. There's a film, uh, I think, I, I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called Torn Apart. Or something. There's a film that they made in Ireland back in the in the, in the 90s about a, a community that turned on a couple because they got, you know, there was a Protestant Catholic marrying. But in the North, it was, it was very rare, very rare. And when the troubles came and the sectarian violence came, there was some intermarried couples that had to sort of pick a side. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of very sad, uh, stuff uh, to do with this when you get into the personal stories, but the but the macro story is basically the border was created in uh, in the 1920s, and the problems that uh, slowly built up over the decades after came to a head in the late 1960s. So the troubles is what that's called. That's the time period that we all know from the movies, from In the Name of the Father, and uh, that might have been in the 80s. But Daniel, Davis- oh no, but In the Name of the Father, the movie came out in 1994. But the, the okay, the event ha- happened in the 70s, and they didn't yeah. get out of jail until the 90s. Got it. And this was a uh, what we learned about oh. in the United States was the IRA. Yeah. So, so but we the didn't bomb. know there's a whole other side. The, the other side is violent as well. That's right. So. Uh, very quickly, the civil rights movement kicked off in the late 1960s, and immediately there was a response from the British state to repress this uh, civil rights movement. And uh, the Protestant, you know, the powers within the Protestant community also rose up against it, same as they had done back in 1913. They were basically like, "Fuck you! This is a Protestant. This is a Protestant government for a Protestant people." That, that's a that's a quote, you know, Protestant state for Protestant people. They didn't want anybody looking for equality. Uh, they rose up against it. But the problem was that the, the sectarian violence became quite serious very quickly. And the British army was called in originally to protect the Catholics against uh, Protestant sectarian violence. But very quickly, uh, uh, you know, the IRA, very quickly, the provisional IRA began uh, a, a campaign of violence themselves. And the state quickly sided with the Protestants. So very quickly, the IRA essentially was created as a, a, a violent nationalist response against a combined force of loyalist paramilitaries and the British state. Now, that's a contentious statement, but that is that is the that is the line from Republican circles, Republican circles pe- being people who believe that they needed to take up arms against British rule in the north of Ireland. And, and is it- this is the IRA a. Um- is it organized? Like, do they hold press conferences with their leaders are out there? Or is it all in the shadows? Uh, so the IRAs, the provisional IRA was uh, was what they are officially, which was a, a break off of the official IRA. The official IRA was essentially like a like a, a hangover from Irish independence back in the you know the late nineteen eighteen through to nineteen twenty two. They had various uh, unsuccessful campaigns, uh, and in the end, they were like a dated sort of like. A, a, a directionless organization. The provisional IRA were basically people who believed that, that they needed to sort of restructure and begin a campaign of violence against the British state that started right there at the at the at the civil rights movement. They were very organized. They were they were divided into active service units. Now again, like beyond this very quick, I can't give you any real details, but they they very quickly organized. Um, but they were also there was also very quickly bold and large action from the British government against them, including a campaign sure. of internment where essentially most young Catholic men in Northern Ireland were rounded up and interned without trial. Essentially it was put in prison a, for yes. Yes. Whoa. Uh, 
which was a huge mistake by the British government, because all it did was create a huge amount of sympathy for the IRA. Essentially, it was a breeding ground for recruitment. And, you know, by the mid 1970s, the provisional IRA were a formidable organization and they were they were they were well organized. And even within prison, uh, which is where a lot of the organization happens, right. yeah, sure. uh, you're, 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 you're really beginning to see the equivalent of, a you know, like a like a rebellious organization. Of course, there is the terrorist versus freedom fighter argument. Yes. The government, of course, immediately puts them in the category of terrorism. Uh, Catholics or nationalists in Northern Ireland uh, put them in the category as fighting on their behalf. Uh, and then obviously there's everything in between in terms of people's opinions. But they were very much believe in a campaign of violence. There were nationalist parties in the North that didn't believe that the the uh, violence was the way to go, like the Social Democratic Liberal Party, the SDLP. John Hume died recently, great man of peace. There were people that wanted to take a, you know, a parliamentarian route, but unfortunately, uh, very quickly, by the early 1970s, violence had taken over, and three decades of what most people think of when they think of Northern Ireland yeah. ensued. And is are these violence, is this like strategic, they're bombing government buildings, or could it just be anybody? Well, you know, I mean, again, like, is that a is like, contentious I, no, it's question? My, yeah, yeah, it's contentious out of my yeah. pay grade. But obviously, the okay. IRA would the IRA would argue that uh, everything was strategic, but they did make mistakes. They put it yeah, in yeah, the yeah. casualties okay. of war category. And again, like, that's like one of those great debates, because it's like, oh, so uh, the IRA are terrorists, but America just dropping random bombs in Iraq. They're not terrorists, even though they're killing more people. They, yeah, you know, what about and, this? And, and what about I'm those not guys? Making, yeah, I'm not making that argument. What I am yeah. saying, though, is that like, it's always a gray area and you know who who's the bad guy and who's the good guy it, it is never clear but certainly if you talk to an english person they will be very negative towards the ira and if you talk to a catholic from the north they'll probably be quite positive towards the ira and if you talk to a catholic from the south you can get you'll get 50-50 you know you'll get some people well actually a higher percentage of people in the south are, are quite critical of the ira and you know they 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 really consider it to be a, a campaign of murder i've had plenty of arguments with people because i've interviewed jerry adams you know jerry adams was a leader of Sinn fein for a very long time i've, yeah. I've interviewed Sinn fein him. is fact, the party that the, represents sorry the party Ter associated with the ira or the, okay. yeah. yeah who are they would but he's like my terrorists. buddy we we yeah. dm you know the leader yeah we jerry DM adams on, you we don't dm know? on twitter really wow yeah. Yeah. So he's no longer the leader of Sinn Féin, but he was for a very long Back time. And he's day, also yeah. he's also a, a number one hate figure for all the moderates. And certainly all, all British people largely think that he's a murderer. And I have gotten a lot of pushback from people who don't like him that I interviewed him for a television series in 2008. I actually interviewed him in the Gaelic language, but uh, I got a lot of pushback from people who were like, how could you talk to that murderer? Platforming uh, him. <laughs> Early days of calling yeah, that. You, were, you were canceled before. Well, they that. were. They were. They were deplatformed. You know, it was. They weren't allowed. Their voices weren't allowed to be heard on the media. So there's, if you look back in the the 70s, 80s, and 90s, any interviews with active members of the IRA, uh, their voices uh, digitized. Like the, you know, oh. it was it was a way to get around the broadcasting. But essentially, they were deplatformed uh, at a time where that wasn't the term that was used. But they were censored on television. You weren't Canceled. allowed to. early cancel culture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, what, I had a question. Wait, I, wait, before we get to that cap. Uh, so we're going to get to the, the, what happened in 1998 in a second, but now a word from your local sponsor. <laughs> go skiing in Vermont. All so right, we're, we're back. Kaplan, go ahead. Sorry. I oh, I was going to, maybe it's a dumb question because you, I, the Catholics in the rest of the UK, how, were they discriminated against and how did they feel about the IRA? I was just thinking about that when you, no, that's like, a very good yeah. question. And the, 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 the history of Catholic discrimination within Great Britain is a very interesting topic. I am not an expert on that, but obviously King Henry VIII created the Church of England so he could fuck other women. And Oh, obviously. Uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. You know, the Church of England is just created by King Henry VIII because he had a falling out with the church. You know, like the church is just another powerful organization in feudal history. You know what I mean? Like when you break down the ridiculousness of religion, you know, it's really all connected to politics. But anyway, King Henry VIII falls out with the church, creates the Church of England. But then anyone who doesn't follow him, he, he fucking kills. So people who held on to their Catholicism suddenly become an enemy of the state. And that divide... It goes all throughout British history, but I, I would I would say, and this is this is just a, a layman's assumption, that uh, within within the U, within the, the island of uh, right. England, England, Scotland, yeah, Wales, yeah, I would think that by the mid 1900s, people aren't feeling too much discrimination for being Catholic. But I okay. would think that 
Protestants in the UK, probably if you looked at them demographically, would probably have a higher sort of a higher wealth. But, you know, again, not my area of expertise, but this, you know, it, it, from this period of time where King Henry VIII creates the Church of England to now, there are numerous moments in history where the divide between Catholics and Protestants uh, rises up. The biggest one being the Jacobite wars, you know, uh, you know, Ki King James versus King William. We're not going to get into that, except <laughs> it's probably bonus. important to know that the big war between King James II, who is, uh, you know, the, they, they were the Jacobites. Uh, against Shout King out. William of Orange, who had taken the throne due to whatever fucking cousin he fucked uh, to give him, even though he was Dutch, uh, he was the King of England. Uh, King James II tried to regain the throne, and the battle took place in England. And the the Protestants, oh, and he was Catholic, by the way. Uh, the Protestants won that battle at the they won that war at the Battle of the Boyne, which is why the Loyalists in Ireland call themselves Orange Men. It's because they backed King William of Orange back in the sixteen. Oh, right? that's why, that, and that's why, yes. as a Syracuse guy, I'm an I have to support the Loyalists. I guess the you have to, right? <laughs> that's right. So, in terms of in terms of our story, the only reason why you need to know why the Catholic Protestant thing is important is it goes all the way back to that and this identity of being an Orange Man. Uh, it was that the Protestant backed King William of Orange defeated the Catholic backed King James II. Uh, and that, I'm pretty sure that was the last major sort of Catholic Protestant divided battle in British history. Wow. I'm just so okay. impressed that you could keep all the kings straight because I've, I've watched oh a lot gosh. of movies. I've read a lot of like things about this over the years and I cannot still right now you're saying names. I know James Henry Kaplan and I did a <laughs> trivia night the other night and we couldn't name a U.S. president before Eisenhower. <laughs> you couldn't awesome. name one before Eisenhower, but uh, we got it right. We got that question right though. We did get it right. Oh, we did get it right. Who, Who was, was right before? Right? Who was oh, right, right before? Truman. 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 We couldn't think. I can. I know. I'm good with the presidents. The kings is like, it's like another language I hear. James. Well, it's very difficult. And even like, just, just, just quickly, just a quick funny thing is like, King James the sixth of Scotland became King James the first of England. Same fucking guy. I mean, oh that's so why like, it's so confusing. It, you gotta, yeah, it's, 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 it's ridiculously much. confusing, but it's all fucking, it's also ridiculous. It's just fucking nonsense that all these inbred it's motherfuckers had all the power. England. Yeah. Yeah. Inbred motherfuckers had all the power in Europe for so fucking long. If they didn't have such hot cousins, they would have it looked different history, but no. <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> so like, we get to 1998. So the troubles are going on from the 60s all the way to 98, and then they yeah. end with Things the Good Friday Agreement. Yes, and finally, finally the, you know, finally the the diplomatic work uh, paid off, and the campaign of violence uh, ended. There was an IRA ceasefire, uh, and also an agreement to decommission arms. So essentially, the end of the violent struggle in Northern Ireland. I mean, we've jumped over 30 years of violence, but I don't think that's the, that's the important part. Yeah, uh, because it's that's very well known. I think most people know about that. It was horrific. And uh, I mean, essentially, the IRA had to admit that we're not going to we're not going to get independence from Britain through violence. So we're going to surrender the, the violent struggle and we're going to become part of a devolved Northern Irish government. So government back at Stormont, you know, because there used to be minimal, um, minimal government in Northern Ireland until uh, the 1970s. And then because of the troubles, Britain uh, went to direct rule. So basically the government in Stormont was dissolved uh, in the early 70s because the whole fucking sh the shit show fell apart. So now devolved government was coming back to Northern Ireland. They would have to be equal representation from two communities, uh, nationalist and uh, loyal unionist communities. And there was it's a very complicated document, but there's all- This was in 98? They finally decided we get equal, equal representation within the government. Yeah, within this devolved government, you know, so oh. like within and that was just that they they look after certain local affairs. Like so they had elite. more power before the six before the troubles that gov local government. They had more I can't even tell you how much power Stormont had. It's really not that important. The only thing that's important about that government was it was a Protestant government for a Protestant people. It was a okay. sectarian. Yeah. Government. Uh, the caste system of sorts. Mm. Yeah, in a way, it's very it's worth thinking of it like Jim Crow in the sense that yeah. Northern Ireland was part of the UK, but there was in terms of local affairs, they had their own rules, uh, right. which were different to the rest of the UK. So really, Storm, it's worth than... thinking of Storm like the government of Arkansas in 1940. Yeah. You know? mm. uh, and now uh, w there was loads of other stuff like uh Obviously, they weren't saying that uh, the Northern Ireland is now part of Ireland, but there was a 
there was an acceptance that the government of the Republic of Ireland would have more involvement with Northern Irish affairs. You know, it was all okay. it was very complicated. Uh, and also, actually, really important thing in the Good Friday Agreement is that prisoners from both the nationalist community and the loyalist community were released under the Good Friday Agreement. Ah, all, so political uh, prisoners, mostly. Uh, yeah, well, you know, their political status was actually the, the main reason why the hunger strikes happened in the 1980s. So all this stuff, like literally every time you ask me something, it's like everything. So everything's an yeah. episode. Almost every one of your questions is an episode. Yeah. But just for the sake of what we're talking about, uh, all those prison people that were imprisoned as a result of the troubles were released under the Good Friday Agreement, despite the fact that a lot of them were in there for mass murder, quote unquote. Yeah. So yeah. this is a this is a big thing. It's also one of my big bugbears in my life is like when people want to fucking get stuck in what aboutism, you know, what about this? What about that? It's like if you look at places like South Africa, like Israel, like Northern Ireland, on some level to move forward, you have to let go of the fucking scars of the past. But yeah. as we can see in Northern Ireland, despite the fact that what we're talking about happened in 1998, it's very difficult it's fucking generational and sometimes it never leaves so it is very difficult but the good friday agreement is a very impressive document a very impressive bit of diplomacy helped by george mitchell bill clinton the irish government tony blair there was a lot of people that understood how uh, delicate this had to be and despite the fact that this episode is inspired by the fact that there is uh, some loyalist violence happening in belfast right now it has largely been successful, but it is delicate and it is very much under threat right now. And it's not just under threat because of the pandemic. It's more under threat because of Brexit, which I think is what we're going to get into. But I think I think that's enough of the coverage. Well, one last question on that. So before we get to now, what was the basic outcome of the 1998 agreement? Um, it seems like the unionists who want to be who are, live in Belfast, Northern Ireland, but consider themselves part of the UK were less happy with the outcome than the nationalists. Is that right? I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a fairer statement to say that the loyalists were less happy. And I'll give you the, the reason why I say that's different. All Protestants, well, sorry, all people that want to remain part of the UK are unionists in that they believe in the union between Great Britain and Ireland, which was created in 1801. That's where the term comes from. Unionist, oh, loyalist right? is what I meant. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But loyalists, Similar. even though it used to be the same, yeah. Loyalists yeah. these days really represent the working class Protestant community uh, who also backed uh, loyalist paramilitary organizations, the main two being the UVF and the UDA. There are other ones, but they're kind of like spinoffs, really. Yeah. Uh, kind of like rap groups. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like Eminem and D12 and stuff. But uh, anyway, the the loyalists were not happy. They felt like losers in this. My opinion having always had more sympathies with the nationalists than I would be, that equality feels like shit when you've been in a position of ascendancy for so long. They would have their own arguments, but needless to say, they weren't delighted. However, uh, it was working. And the issues of making them feel like they were winning in a modern Northern Ireland was one of the issues within that community. But so they, they weren't happy because, as you said, uh, equality was a step down for them. Well, it was that, a step would, that up. would be my that would be my opinion. Now, listen, like I don't want to completely dismiss their concerns within that community. The feeling is that the IRA got away with murder. Literally, the IRA got yeah, away murder. with murder. They, they definitely that they, as part of making peace. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is this is yeah. why it's so fucking complicated. Yeah. But, you know, now, of course, they will always put more blame on the side that they felt hurt them. They they obviously downplay the what their side was doing. This is always the problem. But there's violence on both sides and there's violence on both sides. And there's also history really works against them. They, they are not, you know, like, like the history of, of, of Ireland is very much a history of occupation and inequality. Okay. So history was really good for them in that they were very much the people that benefited from that history. The dismantling of the byproduct of that colonization has not suited them, you know? Uh, now in saying that, they're, they have every right to become very active and winning citizens of this ever-changing landscape of Northern Ireland. But really, they, they largely choose not to be. And I don't blame them because the politics of division has become increasingly more popular in the North. And that is very much being driven by uh, the fact that politics has become more and more extreme. As we've gotten further from the Good Friday Agreement, uh, 
hate speech, all the things that basically escalate have become more popular amongst the voters. That's everywhere. And yeah. Yes. And, uh, you know, the, the loyalist community, rather than being told, guys, it's, it's, it's time to uh, accept uh, our active citizenship in modern Northern Ireland, which, by the way, is still part of the UK. This is the hilarious thing. It's just like they feel like they're losing. It's like literally the, the, the main thing is you want to remain loyal to the crown, which you still have every right to do. But anyway, the thing is that they're not being pushed in the right direction because the politics of division is really winning. And all of these, particularly the DUP, but Sinn Féin, you could say, too, but definitely it's worse in the DUP. The they're DUP is the, is the Democratic party. Unionist yeah. Party. The party and of the loyalists. Yes. The, the, uh, one uh, of traditionally, parties. it wasn't, but it has become that. They, okay. they, are, they are the main Protestant political And they're party. riling people up by stoking. Oh, division. and they're riling it up big time. I mean, their leader, Arlene Foster, you can look her up. I mean, she is literally a figure of hate. I mean, she honestly, she's fucking despicable. I hate the cunt. And I'm yeah. not afraid to use that right. language. She's a horrible human being. Arlene and Foster. She, okay. she, she drives hate like you, like you would not believe. She really is horrific. And I, I have met Andrew Trimble. I, I met the, sorry, David Trimble. Andrew Trimble is a rugby player. I met David Trimble. He was the main unionist leader at the time of the Good Friday Agreement. And he's a nice man. And he, he swallowed his pride and he pushed this thing forward. And he suffered politically for it. You know, uh, Protestant, Protestant politicians suffered more than Catholic politicians for the, uh, for the compromise that was the Good Friday Agreement. David Trimble's career essentially was over, even though he's a, he's a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, wow. because of yeah, that agreement, because of the Good Friday agreement. Yeah. And, and you know, that type of politics has completely left right. the well, Protestant the community. They, so and you said it was, I'm, it's not that I'm anti-unionist politician, but Arlene Foster, she drums up hate. She focuses on just like Trump. She focuses on all the hot topics. So she focuses on flags. She focuses on the Irish language. She focuses on all the things that rile wars, up the base. The Irish culture wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. No, no, she no. focuses on all that rather than, you know, uh, moving forward about the things that matter, like taxation and infrastructure and, and jobs if, and equality. There, has there been people left behind by, I mean, I assume going back to the Good Friday agreements and that removing the threat of terrorism has been a much more, like it's good for the economy. There's travel and uh, tourism, all that stuff must have for the last 30 years or the last- Yeah, Northern years, Ireland is thriving. It the, must be the, thriving, right? Yeah. Northern so, Ireland is thriving. The, 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 simple, the, the easy road that once existed for the Protestant working class isn't there. And listen, the this is yeah. not a Northern Irish problem. This is a problem amongst a lot of working communities in the Western world. Yeah. They have suffered from globalization, or certainly the perception is that they suffer from globalization. And there hasn't been the investment in helping that community to get a piece of an ever-changing world. And that is, a, that is a fair argument from them, 100%. However, there has been huge economic growth as a result of the Good Friday Agreement, tourism being just one of those areas. Uh, you know, Game of Thrones has been huge for Ireland. There's like a lot of, I didn't realize we'd have so many Game of Thrones references in this episode. But the <laughs> point is, is that where they film this it? Podcast. I didn't even know that. Yeah, all the all the sort of cold, foresty stuff is filmed in Northern Ireland. Neither right? Turner or I watch the show, but we our guests love to talk Game of Thrones. Yeah, we talk about it every every few episodes. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's a good reference point in terms of what we were talking about earlier. But then, obviously, Game of Thrones is filmed in Belfast. It's been huge. It's been huge for for Ireland tourism in general, but certainly for Northern Ireland. Uh, so it's been a net benefit. It's 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 impossible to debate. But the fact that it's been a net benefit is not enough for these people to not want to fucking yeah. burn the house down as a result of their anger. And when you, know, you say it's uh, segregated Northern Ireland, like it seems like certain neighborhoods have only the Catholics, certain neighborhoods have only the Protestants. Is it that segregated? It is. And that jumps back right to the beginning of the troubles. One of the worst things that happened right at the beginning of the troubles is uh, Protestant paramilitary forces burnt Catholics out of mixed neighborhoods. So there were certain neighbors that were mixed. Yeah. Uh, and they were friendly. You know, you took that. You you can go back and read these incredibly sad personal accounts of neighbors who are friends their whole lives and uh, uh, were, were made enemies overnight. And whether they actually became enemies, it didn't matter. They had to go. It wasn't like their neighbors were going to be like, "I'm going to defend Patrick because he's a good man." It was basically like, "There's nothing I can do. You got to get the fuck out of here. You're about to die." Wow. And vice versa. Catholics burn Protestants out. Of course, they will both argue that one did it more doesn't matter. What does matter is at the end of that period of time, there were uh, essentially Catholic ghettos, Protestant ghettos, and you didn't go into either one. For example, like Bobby Sands, who died in the hunger strike, he grew up in a mixed area, but they got burnt out and he ended, he ended up having to, to live somewhere else. So, so that happened all over the North, but particularly in Belfast and Derry. And uh, 
the that division really it still exists today in the wealthier areas it's it's mixed but in the working class communities you live in a catholic community or you live in a protestant community and there's a wall right and there is literally a wall uh the peace walls aren't That's as important crazy. as the, the peace walls aren't as important as they used to be yeah but you know, there, there, there was walls. a time where they were essentially, yeah, they're called peace walls, which yeah. is hilarious because they're Trump could have called it a peace wall. Maybe he would have got it. He should have called it a peace wall. If there was animosity between Mexico and the United States, he could have called it a peace wall. Yeah. Uh, so these you walls know, are to, it, protect, to pre- prevent violence in theory, right? Yeah. Like, instead like, of, you know, presenting, uh, preventing the, the free movement of, of, of low cost labor, which is essential for economic growth. But anyway, whatever, man. I, I don't like keep dropping these political points on you guys. Yeah. But the <laughs> point away. is that when I was there, so my other, my other, uh, I yeah, you've been bit. you've toured Northern Ireland, regular Island. Is it called yeah, regular? The, the other, the, <laughs> yeah, Ireland. The regular Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it's not Ireland. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, in in 2005, I I made this documentary series on TV. In 2006, it was stand up comedy workshops in disadvantaged communities. But one of the communities I chose to work with was a loyalist community in North Belfast, in a, in a state called Mount Vernon, which is run by the UVF. And uh, so I was very much behind enemy lines, and I was working with Billy Hutchinson, who actually was a signatory, a signator of the Good Friday Agreement, head of the Progressive Unionist Party, who in the interim have been completely sidelined. They have no political power anymore because they were very much a progressive organization trying to move the working class loyalist community forward. But they no, just haven't been that. able they haven't been able to gain a foothold because of the ever rising power of the of the DUP. Needless to say, I very much uh, was able to live in that divided North Belfast community where one of the main parks in that neighborhood still has a wall through it. The, the Antrim Road is the more Catholic part of North Belfast, which separates it from the two uh, loyalist estates of Tigers Bay and Mount Vernon. What's even worse is the Tigers Bay is a UDA estate a different faction of loyalist paramilitaries who hate the UVF just as much as they hate the people in uh, the, the Antrim Road. So they hate Catholics as well as members of the UVF. So not, the peace wall separates the Catholics from the Protestants. There is no peace wall between uh, Tigers Bay and Mount Vernon, which was are a you problem. Seen, are you seen as an American or are you seen as a Catholic? Well, first of all, I'm seen as Irish American Catholic, which is not popular in the loyalist community. No, it's actually worse, we, right? We were, yeah, we were very openly in support of the IRA. We had ah. a naive, we had a naive love for the IRA growing up here in Irish America. You see that all throughout uh, Irish American history at that time. Uh, Whitey Bulger, of course, was famously involved with gun running. The mayor of Boston got uh, was involved in a, a ship of guns that was caught. Uh, Irish American financial support of the IRA is well known. I, I experienced a lot of hate when I moved to Ireland based on that. I don't mean overall hate. People liked me, but they liked pointing out how fucked up it was that yes. we were giving money to the IRA. I mean, I was 14. It wasn't my money. I wasn't was, giving you my didn't fucking, give money. <laughs> I wasn't giving my allowance money yeah, to the yeah, IRA. Yeah. Honestly, personally, when I was He's 14, t- I just wanted to join the fucking IRA. That's how naive and stupid I was. I mean, was. I think we all did. We all watched those movies and we're like, <laughs> yeah. this is awesome, man. Freedom going out, the fu- going out the front door at Jerry. I mean, we I watched in the name of the father. The Propaganda works. Well, I would yeah. like to have an Irish accent. That I always wanted without being... <laughs> I know it's just very hard to do one properly, you know. No, I don't. And what was your bit? You had a bit about this. Well, I have two bits. I have two oh. two stand-up bits that I've done throughout my career. The first one was in relation to the Irish Americans supporting uh, the IRA. So when I in the early part of my comedy career, I used to go up to Belfast a lot. I really loved indulging in this kind of like you know political humor about the North. So I would come out and I would say, uh, you know, hi, I'm an Irish American Catholic. Uh, but don't worry, guys, I haven't come for our money back, right? Which people would laugh because <laughs> just a lot of a lot of context. Uh, that is just known, you know, yeah. like you say that in America, perhaps they wouldn't understand the context, but the joke that I said when I was, so when I was making this documentary series, by the way, you can watch this on YouTube. It's called, uh, it's called join the hood. Join and, the hood. uh, the episode five was Mount Vernon Belfast. It's on YouTube. But my opening joke was I was in this UVF bar and I'm Irish American Catholic. So I walked up on stage. I said, wow. I said, look at this. I'm an Irish American Catholic performing comedy to an audience of people in the UVF. Well, if the UDA had any sense, they'd blow us up now and get two for the price of one, which I, I thought was hilarious. I know you're fake laughing because I said it yesterday. No, but, no, I forgot. I, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But uh, it didn't go down well, actually. It went down well in the series that I had the gall to tell that joke, but yeah. it was just uh, it was just a step too far. In the room, you're saying? In it the room, it, well. just, it didn't go down. But, you know, mm-hmm. obviously my joke then afterwards is that Protestants have no sense of humor. But that, in a way, that sectarian humor, which is very much like Protestants don't have a sense of humor, 
that sectarian humor is something that I wouldn't do today, but I definitely indulged in hey, it back then. That's a I, that's a Jewish bit. What are you doing? <laughs> oh yeah, but, but I, it's a sectarian problem. You guys have to. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We all have our own sectarian. <laughs> we all have our Lost. we all have our own issues. Actually, if you can, I, I, we didn't say this yesterday, but I'll tell you another crazy story. So sure. when I was living in that estate, Mount Vernon, I mean. You know, there was a Catholic kid killed while I was there. I was walking up in the middle of the night with a helicopter shining a light through my window. I mean, you know, you're talking about real, real stuff was going on. Sectarian violence was still happening, even though this was well after the Good Friday Agreement. And a lot of people would argue that loyalist paramilitaries have maintained a sort of a more violent sectarian energy. But anyway, when I was in this bar, it's called the Grove Tavern. I would go there a lot. It was fun, you know, try to just basically become friends with these people, you know, and I had a good time, but I mean, this shit was rough. So one night karaoke was on and I had gotten to know this woman, Ida. I, 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 I think it's IDA. It doesn't matter. Her name is Ida. Okay. And she's written about in a famous book about uh, women murderers of the troubles. You know, she oh, was whoa. released, she so was released under the good Friday agreement, but Jesus. she killed numerous women in the troubles. She's oh, a mass wow. murder. Oh, she make a movie about her. They need she's free under the good Friday agreement. Right. And, uh, big boozer and she's fucking we're all i wasn't drunk but they were all drunk in the grove tavern and karaoke was on and ida asked me will, will we will we sing a song together oh. so i picked losing my religion by rem <laughs> and, <laughs> and i sang losing my religion with this uh protestant female mass murderer uh which is in the documentary were I don't you know known people, at this point around like did she pick you because she knew you from tv so the thing is that in that whole series, Join the Hood, I was known in every community except for the UVF community. They don't watch RTE, so they don't watch Irish TV. They're very much focused on British TV. Ah. So I was unknown. I was just, essentially to them, I was just like a community worker. Yeah. <laughs> but I was making a documentary. With but the they camera. Yeah, they didn't see me as famous oh. in any yeah. way. So we get karaoke shops. Oh, sorry. <laughs> to... Um, to this week. So basically 1998 happens and then it's pretty that that thing basically works, right? The Good Friday agreement. Why are people flipping out now? Yeah, what is And well, it's yeah. It's Brexit Bre Brexit is the main motivator. Brexit Brexit forced uh more discussions about the border and the future of the north because Brexit is such an ill thought out thing anyway, but the fact that there was a land border in Ireland between the UK and Ireland uh, was just part of Brexit, and Ireland is part of the EU. So and Ireland is in the EU. As right, was that's the something UK, they didn't obviously. seem to get thought out at all. And by the way, the EU made resolving the Northern Ireland issue so much easier because you know it was just like the free movement of goods anyway, so it wasn't an issue. You know, yesterday we talked about it that you know there used to be a border. I remember going over the border in the early nineties, and you know, gunmen up in towers, and it was it was a distinct difference. You know, it was a and hard border, uh, Northern Ireland to Ireland. A hundred percent, it was a hard border between Ireland and the UK. Although Ireland and the UK had their own, you know, they had their own treaties and stuff, but but there there was a hard border. But Ireland and the UK were both in the EU, so that did make things uh, make things a little bit easier, right? So Brexit obviously was going to create a huge problem, and in the end, after various you know, solutions that weren't accepted, backstops and different things. They they did come up with a solution, which essentially, as you said yesterday, I don't want to make people think that I know more than you. <laughs> you pointed out that they put a border in the Irish Sea, essentially. Yeah, so the border used to be between Northern Ireland and Ireland. And they said, well, these people all share the same island and one is now in the EU and one is not. So that seems can we, are we going to make, and, and the hard border had been gone for a while because they were all in the EU up until December. Right. Right. Yeah. That, so the thing is that for the purpose of trade, they basically said, as far as trade goes, Northern Ireland's still in the EU. Essentially. Right. That's what they're saying. And then, but then, uh, so that British, makes Northern Ireland, uh, it, it's, it, yeah. So instead of having the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, they essentially moved it back to be, and again, get your maps out to the, the middle of the Irish sea. So it's between the mainland of the United Kingdom, if that's the term and Northern Ireland. So now if you're in Northern Ireland uh, and you're loyal to the crown, you're, you're now just, more part of Ireland than you are part of the United Kingdom. And that's yeah, no good. Yeah. There was yeah. British, there was British uh, some goods that weren't making it to supermarket shelves that they stopped shipping. From England. Yeah, I mean, there was some massive growing pains because, yeah. well, everything about Brexit was a fucking shit show, but there was huge growing pains because obviously rem remaining in the EU has huge benefits because you have access to this huge market. However, when your supply lines are, are traditionally with the UK and then suddenly you find out that, oh, fuck, 
Now there's a hard border between us and our main suppliers, particularly supermarkets literally weren't, weren't getting their shelf stock because stuff was getting held up, you know, and there was just debates over, you know, who pays duty on what, you know, customs on what. So it, 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 even after the resolution, it turned out to be quite problematic. I have not actually stayed as up on how they've resolved those issues. But what's important in relation to the violence rising up is it was another example of loyalists just beginning to feel further and further away from the UK, more of a sense of nationalists winning uh, another step in the sense that despite the fact that their perception is that the violence came from the other side, that they continue to slowly win. Yes. And so their solution, and I've seen it's like kids as young as 12, 13 years old. Yeah. The solution is violence, I guess. I mean, there is no solution. So, I mean, blowing so up violent. a bus doesn't really solve the supermarket shelves. But. It's not going to solve the um, <laughs> Brexit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, it's very interesting because it, it, there's always a certain amount of politics behind who has sympathy or not for a rioter. <laughs> And yes, we've seen this. Depends uh, on your perspective. This, we've seen this I, issue pop up on 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 Fox and uh, CNN in terms of a a sympathy for um, uh, for violence that rises up uh, during a Black Lives Matter protest and the criticism of that violence. And then the flip side, January sixth, and everybody's got their fucking points. And honestly, a lot all of these points are actually true in that, yeah. you know, the, the, the sympathy is actually rational. But then at the same time, the hypocrisy isn't. And it's, it's very difficult to to make sense of that. But one thing we can say for sure is that uh, riots don't fucking rise up in contented society, whether that discontent is acceptable or, or is understandable or not is open for debate. Yeah. But this violence, particularly when you're not that far removed from a legacy of violence anyway, is easy for it to rise up. That's why this shit is so delicate. Well, and that's, that's why Brexit say. Brexit was such a fucking disaster because you're already dealing with a pressure cooker and now you've just fucking turned up the heat. And the move, is it like, I mean, this might be, I don't this could be offensive to say, but if the um, culture, if there's a culture in your family and your dad, if your dad went out 30 years ago and, like violence was the answer to figuring things out. Well, then that way, if you're 13 years old now, yeah, you does be. it come as more second nature than it would to like, I don't know, Kaplan's kids? <laughs> well, there's a culture, there's a culture of rioting out there anyway. They, 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 they do these huge bonfires on July 12th. And, you know, this is not the first of these riots since the Good Friday Agreement. It just yeah. seems more serious now because one of the things that has been a little irresponsible in my opinion, and I've been, I've done it myself is, there's more talk of a united Ireland now based on the fact that it just seems a little more practical. Like suddenly a united Ireland just seems to make more sense. You yeah, know, they used they, to be sure. A, they have the EU ahead. membership already is as Tyler, as Tyler was saying, it's built in. So if you're in Northern Ireland, you're a member of the EU or you could be an Irish citizen and you're a member of the EU already. So it seems. Yeah. Like so it just, you know, years ago, the argument was always like, Oh, fucking the Republic of Ireland doesn't want the North who could afford that yeah. shit show. And Britain would give uh, Britain would give Northern Ireland a heartbeat if, if 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 they could, you know, this kind of stuff. Whereas these days, it almost feels like it seems strange that people would hold on to their loyalist identities because, in actual fact, you'd be better off just remaining, uh, you're just becoming a, a United Ireland. But obviously, that's the biggest trigger of all. And then you throw the pandemic on top of that. People haven't been working; they've been stuck in their houses. And then, as we talked about yesterday, the perception also has been that. Uh, you know, the at the funeral of Bobby Story, a famous Irish Republican, it was a huge public funeral, which was against pandemic regulations. And there was no repercussions for that. And that, the, the, by the way, the leader of Sinn Féin in the North, Michelle O'Neill, was at that funeral. I mean, literally the highest in power in the North on the Catholic side were at that funeral. How they many people are at this funeral? It's a like lot a of people. Like a Hasid funeral? It, it, very, very like a Hasid funeral. Without the <laughs> techno, without the techno and the dancing and yeah. all, you know, <laughs> but uh but the, the but but they 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 didn't get punished. Uh whereas there was huge restrictions against uh, July 12th marching. So once again, the perception was that there's one rule for the Catholics, one rule for us, which is an argument that you're used to hearing over here in the United States. There yeah. is very much uh, a culture of grievance, whether it's warranted or not, is is open for debate. But that yeah. culture of grievance has now spilled onto the streets, except that Prince Philip died. And they, as out of respect for Prince Philip, they have uh, stopped the violence. And my hope is that it won't rise up again. But it's very hard to know because I think that the the leaders within the loyalist paramilitary groups are really driving it. Prince it's Philip, kind of amazing they stopped because of Prince Philip. Although yeah. I guess that's their... 
No, that's their Royalty. thing, man. Their whole yeah, identity yeah, yeah. is the crown. Because they're loyalists. The queen, yeah. yeah, the queen. And so that 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 really ties in. Like they're holding they, there's certain symbols within the loyalist community that are really important for them. You see them when you visit Belfast, you know, either side of the wall, the Shank Hill Road or the Falls Road. The Falls Road's nationalist. You'll see murals that are dedicated to the hunger strikers, Bobby Sands, uh, people that were shot in Derry, Bloody Sunday. Those are the murals you'll see. Very much the narrative of struggle for freedom. On the other side of the wall, you see murals dedicated to soldiers who died in the Battle of the Somme, uh, you know, murals of Queen Elizabeth, and basically all uh, loyalty to the glory of the British Empire. And that is right, very yes. much that's very much their identity and the identity on the other side. So their and, their identity then would be the most British. They're like the most Brexit type people then in a way, right? I mean, and they did vote for Brexit. Yeah. However, Northern Ireland, uh, the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted against Brexit. Uh, yeah. And that would be because you would be sure that any uh, Protestants in the business community who are actually just much like, there's a lot of people that have really moved on. You know, like there are entrepreneurs, business owners, uh, you know, uh, intellectuals, on both sides of the sectarian divide that have moved on. They're working together. They want a peaceful, prosperous Northern Ireland. All those people would have been Remainers. The people who voted against uh, Brexit would have been hardline DUP people, you know, people, Presbyterians who are very much still holding on to this importance of their loyalist identity. And then obviously the working class loyalist community who, uh, you know, they, they just align with all the culture of grievance. They're anti- on top of their loyalism. They're very anti-immigration, uh, racist, homophobic. They, you know, there's a there's a lot of uh, get it all. Touch all the. Bases. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> there's a lot of hate in there. Yeah, we know the tropes. Um, so this is my last question for you. Do you feel because you're going to be touring Ireland, you tour Ireland all the time to big audiences. Do you feel odd? Like, is there any rep? Um, uh, what do you call that? Do you feel talking about this to to us on the podcast? Do you feel like, oh, I shouldn't say this. I shouldn't say that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not worried about talking about this. I mean, okay. There, there, Cause we don't know a lot of times how controversial even the questions we're asking are to the people who know the country. We're too much better stupid than we to know what's going yeah, We're too dumb That's to know about us. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I would say the only controversial thing about me is I, I clearly have more sympathies with the nationalist side, but I'm trying to put it across in a, in a rational way that suggests that uh, I also have sympathy for the anger that's within yeah. the loyalist. If everybody sure. I mean, thought like you and thought about both sides, we'd be in a better place. You know? Well, I mean, honestly, I really, everything I say about loyalism, I kind of borrow from Billy Hutchinson himself, who expressed to me a concern for loyalism because he felt that they were not really moving forward, that they were choosing to sort of stay stuck in, in a culture of grievance. Learn to cut. Uh, and he, he he actually pointed out to me that he's quite jealous of the nationalist community in the sense that they they have been more proactive. They've they've focused more on the education of their people. They've focused more on equality. Essentially, he's basically saying that they did a better job of of uh, moving their people forward, which which makes sense when if a group hasn't really had to make as much effort to yeah. to progress to progress then it, you know they can be lazy. I mean, as as a group, Billy Hutchinson expressed to me that. Uh, the loyalist community has been complacent and that complacency at the time didn't seem so problematic, but that complacency now seems really problematic in that they seem to be responding to their lo- loss of position in society with violence. It's hard to repeat as a champion. That's what they say. You can play <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, champions yeah. for a while. <laughs> that's why it's hard. Yeah. And obviously Billy's we cur- laugh, but we also are aware of the seriousness of what we're talking about. Of, of course. course. Um, wow. Okay, Des. I think that's it, Cap. Did I, I any mean, more questions? Went, no, I mean, we, I feel I, I get smart every week from this podcast, but this week I am extra smart because go run and tell your kids before you forget this it. Time, I really feel like, like if we don't know stuff about this topic in like a week from now, shame on both of us. But yeah, Des <laughs> Bishop podcast. Everybody, check out the Des Bishop podcast on uh, wherever you iTunes. Yeah, wherever you get stuff. your podcast. He always at, records at, his. He always presses the record. Yes, <laughs> that is that is 100% not true, which oh. is why I had sympathy for you guys and your <laughs> problems yesterday. Everybody, everybody has made that mistake at least once at Des Bishop on Instagram, which is where I do most of my stuff uh, nowadays. Check it out. Oh, by the way, if you are interested in that episode about where I live with the loyals, it's called uh, Join the Hood. It's on YouTube somewhere. Just put in Des Bishop Join the Hood. We'll and actually, it, if you're interested about my in time in China, watch Breaking China is also on YouTube. Six. Episodes. Yes. Breaking China. Um, it, it was pretty fascinating. You did do a set in like a theater in China. I mean, you probably did more than this, but at the end of the year, right? You did a set in a theater in Chinese. 
one year. Yeah, which was actually my 10 month, 10 and a half months into my time in China. I did that set, which we wow. kind of used. It's insane. We kind of used that as the the gig, quote unquote, that like I had made it. But it was almost, a, it was fake really in the sense that I had actually been gigging in Chinese from about seven months because I had gotten involved with all these, you know, the Beijing yeah. tokos, your guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a momentous occasion and we didn't actually play it as such in the series in that we ended episode five with my gig in Chinese. Uh, and actually what I thought was the way more momentous uh, accomplishment was we ended the series with me being on a Chinese dating show called Bai Li Tiao Yi, not the biggest one. Yes. But the, I remember the show. that we show. My, yeah. my wife's uncle called me and told me you were on it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> He didn't yeah. know you. He just knew like a white guy was on it. <laughs> and that went really well. I didn't get a woman, but that went really well. And the, fu the funny thing about this that- This is like was, a th 50 million people watch this show, Kaplan. It was like this yeah. gigantic, like the whole country's watching this dating show. Yeah, and, and the funny thing about that was that uh, we, we asked permission to use the footage, but they didn't give us permission in time, but we had already ripped it from DVR. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. And we, inc we included it in the series because China's so funny like that. We did eventually get permission, but we did actually broadcast it without- Permission. I mean, you got to I mean, shoot gun. You got to shoot they, first. Ask questions last over there. Sometimes they so, worry so, about intellectual property over there now. I mean, you can. but 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 actually, coincidentally enough, it was directly connected to that show that I did with Joe Wong because in that show that I did with Joe Wong, I made a joke about visiting the marriage market with my mother. My mother was in the crowd, and I, it was an improv. Actually, I got in trouble afterwards because I that wasn't cleared as a joke, even though it wasn't a problematic joke. I strayed from my script that had been cleared by the censors mm. uh, because that was one of those shows where you needed to do that. What was it? Shen P? Is that what they call that? The marriage market? Uh, I don't know. It was this place. No, no, no. The the oh. When you apply to the censor for your material, I think it was Shen P. I think oh, it was I the never Chinese, did that. The Chinese were, yeah. Well, I didn't do it often, but I had to do it for that show. Yeah. And I, as an improv, I basically said that, uh, you know, I'm not married and uh, my mom's here. So uh, we went to the marriage market, right? Yes. And that got a good laugh. The thing was that, a producer from Bai Li Taui was in the audience that night and they contacted me and they were like, would you like to be on Bai Li Taui? Oh, wow. And then that, that became, that was like literally my last week of filming. We went there and uh, that became like the, that became like the closer. It was a gigantic show. Also the marriage market quickly is this place in the middle of Shanghai, a park, people's park. I think it's people's. Uh, yeah, yeah, where, Renmin, Renmin Gong, right? Renmin Gong, yeah. yeah. And um, they, like, grandmothers and grandfathers go out with signs. No pictures. Or at least at the time, no pictures. Maybe they have them Sometimes now. they have a little picture. Sometimes and they And their don't. grandchild, and they're trying to, like, marry them off. Not marry them off. Get, set them up on dates with other people's grand. Like, it's all grandparents out there. And they'll say, my daughter is five foot four or whatever. You know, she's uh, weighs this much. She has this degree. <laughs> she amazing. works at this company. And, and then a grandfather will be like, my, my son would love that girl. And then they send him up, they call them and they go, I just got you a date. And the, the kids are like, do the kids always agree to go out? Is that like, a probably not. I would imagine the, 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 the grandparents call it. I got loads of phone calls after that, after that meeting. But I never, I, I, I did meet, I, I, I went on Fei Chung Wura. My second year in China, I went on Fei Chung Wura, which is the, the much bigger show. dating show. And I did actually not only win a date with a girl, but I won a trip to the Maldives. Oh, that's the one uh, I'm thinking of. I yeah, remember that, that. that. That's the one you're yeah. thinking of. Yeah. No, the, the first one was Bai Li Tiao Yi, which is on the Dong, Dong Fang Wei shirt, you know, the, the, the Shanghai station. Yeah. And uh, I, that was smaller, but actually that episode was way more fun. My Fei Chung Wura episode wasn't as fun, but it's also like more serious. And did they you go with the girl to the Maldives? No. So what happened was it's so disappointing because if you, if you pick, if, if when you, so you walk out at the beginning and they all leave their lights on or not. And if 22 or more women leave their light, there's four, 24 women, but if 22 or more of them leave their lights on, then you have a chance to win a trip to, uh, Sheila or more Daifu to the Maldives or Greece. And one guy, and you're the only guy, you're the bachelor. I'm the bachelor. I walk out. They'll so 23, the the rose. 23 left their lights on. So I was in with Amazing. a chance. And one girl at the end was still available. So then it's up to me. Do I want to take her off the show or not? So I took her off the show and, and we both want a trip to the Maldives. But then as it turns out, the Maldives trip is just like you go to the Maldives with like six to eight people who also want a trip to the Maldives. Uh, and yeah. like, you have to share a room with another Get guy winner. Discount. It's not like a date, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Sure. And it's like it's some promo thing for some Chinese holiday company so she went i think i didn't go i only had one more date with her oh you just never and even went 
You ever go? You turn down trips to the Maldives? Wow, that's true. You're gonna go be a roommate with some guys. Yeah, but you know, the truth was that I was like living. It was my second year in China. And uh, I was really just into being in China. So I was like, I don't really need to go to the Maldives because I really just want to be here working on sure. my Chinese. You know what I mean? It's Amazing. like Maldives so I, so is such I, a I, honeymoon I destination, except for this one reality show that's there. It's <laughs> like all like rich couples from America. And then <laughs> I know. And also, to be honest with you, just going with like a group of Chinese, like I love China and I love Chinese people, but just like going with a group of Chinese that I don't really know, like they just socialize in a very different way. So it would just be fucking hell for me. You yeah, know, it'd, be, have a, it'd turn into have, prison pretty quick. Yeah, like all these like fucking formal dinners and just weird shit that you have to do. Plus, they just sit there and fucking look at their phone. You know, like I, I just would, I just wouldn't be able. I don't want to give first, you my first month. I moved there and done you know, this. I had I I worked at a school. It's like in two thousand four, and I was like to all the coworkers. There's probably like twelve of them. I'm like, hey, everybody, come over to my place. I'm gonna have a party on Saturday. And they're like, okay, cool. I just want to get to know everybody. And so I get a ton of beer and like alcohol and everything. And I was like, yeah, it starts. They're like, what time does it start? I'm like, I don't know, like eight. Like, okay, cool. And there's like six foreigners who work there and maybe like 10 Chinese people. And uh, the Chinese people all show up at eight on the dot, maybe even like 730. And then are on their phones for like an hour and then leave without like no interaction. And then it was two different parties. The expats all showed up at like 1030, like half drunk already. And they're like, Woo-hoo, where are we going? <laughs> it was the funniest, like welcome to China moment of all time. Yeah. Yeah. It's very different. Uh, the, the socializing is, is very, anyway, long story short, uh, the, I did that in the second year. That wasn't part of the documentary, but anyway, just a little China memory for you there. Turner. That's it. Thank you, Des. Thanks for doing it twice. Um, thanks for coming back. Everybody check out Daz on tour. I think he's going to be around the U S this year and around, uh, Ireland at some point later. So go check out his website. Also check out his podcast, Des Bishop, the Des Bishop podcast, right? Yeah. The, the promo has been, has been complete. Thank you very much. That's it. Kaplan. What should we do? I got to go make my kids lunch. So I'm going to get lost. Get lost. <laughs>